Hi. Oh, it's so good to see you and hear you. Yeah, I'm really happy to see your face. From deep inside a cupboard in my house, behind a wall of clothes to muffle the background noise, I'm Mia Friedman, co-founder of Mamma Mia, and welcome to a special mini episode of No Filter called How Are You Doing? Where I call up a friend to see how they're doing in this very weird time when none of our lives resemble the ones we were living just a few short weeks ago. Today, I'm calling up one of my best friends, Amelia Lester. She's a journalist and a writer. Some of you may know her if you listen to the podcast we used to host together about Trump's America called Tell Me It's Gonna Be Okay. Doesn't that seem like a long time ago? Amelia and I met when she was the editor of the Good Weekend magazine and she was living in Sydney, which is her hometown actually, but she's lived most of her adult life in America. She moved there to go to Harvard on a scholarship in 2001 and she returned to Australia a few years ago to be close to her family and for that big job at the Good Weekend. But soon after, she left to marry her partner, who is a military doctor and who's based Well, wherever the military want him to go. And right now, that's Washington, D.C. I'll let Amelia fill you in on the rest. Oh, how are you doing? Big question. (laughs) Yeah, I'm finding when people ask me that, I'm like, do you really want to know how I'm doing? Because I experience emotions these days in waves. And so the last day has been pretty good wave we had a good dinner tonight and explain where you are so for those who don't know explain who you're socially isolating with where you're living what your current um the situation is okay so I'm living in Washington DC and I live with my one and a half year old son and my husband who is a doctor And so he has been exposed to patients at work who who have tested positive. And it's not as though the protocol says if a doctor interacts with a positive patient, they have to self-isolate. Obviously, that wouldn't make any sense for doctors. But out of an abundance of caution, we're just saying that um, if he does interact with a positive patient, he'll go and stay in a friend's basement apartment for a few days. Mm. So for the last week, that's what he's been doing. And then he came home today, which was really exciting. And we decided to celebrate by ordering really good Thai food from this restaurant that we would never normally be able to get into, but they're offering curbside pickup. Ah. And it was just a moment of like, enjoying nice food with one's family and feeling like maybe you can still have these moments of pleasure and joy in your life. How long, you haven't lived in Washington DC for very long and you've also buried the lead, uh, which is unusual for a journalist like you because you are, (laughs) how pregnant are you? Oh, I just, I just went into my third trimester. I only do podcasts with you when I'm pregnant. That's a rule. (laughs) (laughs) And it's, I'm not going to lie. It is, it has been extremely difficult. I know everyone's got their own personal challenges and journeys through the COVID crisis. Being pregnant during it has been really really hard because every day there's a new news story that suggests something about the risks and we just don't know enough. So I'm finding that when people seek to reassure me, I get kind of angry at them. I know they're trying to do the right thing, but no one can reassure me because no one yet knows. Well, we haven't heard of any cases of pregnant women. I mean, you know, what what do we know? But I, I don't think that they're saying particularly that pre- pregnant women are more vulnerable than others in the same way that maybe children seem less vulnerable. I'm, again, I'm trying to tell you it's all going to be okay. Um, I can't help it. It's funny what, that you say that actually because when we speak, I always have to try to work out what it is. And I do this with a lot of my friends, what that person wants to hear at that time because sometimes mm. we need cheering up. Other times you just need someone to go, yeah, this is fucked and this is scary. Yeah, 
Yeah. And it can change from day to day. It can because it's like that uh, there was this Harvard Business Review article this week or maybe it was last week that was really powerful about the fact that what we are all experiencing, and I think you discussed this on the podcast it maybe, is that we're experiencing grief yeah, and we're moving through the stages of grief. And one thing that the guy who wrote the article pointed out, he came up with the stages, is that we always forget that the stages are not experienced in a linear fashion. So oh. we always forget that. And so you can wake up one day and feel anger, which I have, I have plenty of anger. Uh, I live in the United States. I think you can imagine Mm. who I'm directing that to. And then I wake up another day and I feel sad and, and you never quite know how you're going to feel on a given day um, because the grief stages are not linear. That's so true. So you can be angry, then you can be in denial, then you can be accepting the situation and then you can, yeah, that, that's so true. Your family are all around the world and you don't actually have any family in Washington, you and right. your husband, um, Johnny. How are your parents? Where, where else in the world is everybody for you? So my brother is um, in London with his family and my parents are self-isolating in a very responsible way uh, in Sydney, um, and they haven't really left the house, um, and I'm really pleased about that because it just feels like one thing that I can cross off the list. But I think for a lot of people who have lived expatriate lives, this has been a really again, confronting thing because you always assume that you can hop on a plane. Mm -hmm. And we're now realizing that that was a false assumption and the world suddenly feels really big again. Because at one point I said to you, and I didn't know if it was the right thing to say or not, but like, do you want to get on the last plane out of Washington? Because I have another friend in Washington who did do that. Um, But he was able to because his wife and and daughter could come with him. But you, if you were going to make that choice, you would have had to leave your husband behind. Was that ever a consideration? No, I never even considered it because, well, I don't want to judge other people's choices in this, but I'm trying really hard to do what I think is the responsible thing. Mm -hmm. And People are being told in the States right now to varying degrees of seriousness, you need to stay where you are Mm. and you need to be with your immediate family. And the idea of me getting on a plane, going back to my parents who are in a high risk group in Australia, when we know that a bunch of cases in Australia came actually from people who traveled from the United States, Mm. Tom Hanks might be one of them. Yeah. It, It didn't feel like, the, it's to, to, for me, it didn't feel like the responsible thing to do. Mm. And also I have to weather this with my, um, with my nuclear family. Mm. Your and chosen husband, is, your chosen family, which is your husband. Yep. And the other thing is that I have my, my health, my healthcare system here. I have a midwife who I really like, and I have a hospital that I know, and it just didn't seem like the time to be uprooting myself and also the whole world's going to have this there's no point running from it Mm. is it is it impacting on your prenatal uh care and your birth plans well you've probably seen that a couple of hospital systems in new york in the last week said that women were not allowed to bring any support system into the room for birth and that struck a lot of people as really extreme and a number of women have already given birth under those circumstances and said it was predictably horrible. To me, if I was a first time mother, I would be so upset by that. I completely understand. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to prepare myself for the possibility that that might need to happen. The hospitals have come out and said the reason why they had to do that is because two women who were asymptomatic then tested positive after their babies were born. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, they'd interacted with between 15 and 20 healthcare workers through their long labors. And there are only so many obstetricians out there. If they all get sick, they can't be useful. 
So I get why they have to do it. And I'm just trying to prepare for the idea that I might have to. And I think I can. Yeah. You, I mean, you can, you can, but it's, it's another little grief, isn't it? It's like, it's another little loss, like all these it is. little losses that are real. But let me turn that around, like to the, uh, the flip side of that is, this is such a cliche, but it turns out that you have to think, well, what is the most important thing about giving birth? Yeah. It is that you can have a baby yeah. and that that baby hopefully is is free of serious complications mm. and that the birth is free of serious complications that's what you can hope for yeah it, it's I, I've been I think about you so much and I've got a couple of friends who are doctors or whose partners are doctors or nurses or healthcare workers and you you're almost living this um two-speed life in your house because you're socially isolating, your world's very small and it's you and it's JJ in the house. And then your husband, Johnny, is out literally on the front lines. And so how do you, how do you bridge that divide between the two of you? I am envious of people who can self-isolate with their, with their partner and kind of hunker down together. But Mm. I understand through this that for most doctors, I really think it's kind of a calling. Like I have a a couple of close friends in addition to my husband who are doctors and none of them, fear is not really part of the vocabulary. Like they are such practical people Mm. and they just want to do their job, which is to look after people when they're sick. And they almost, the characteristic I see in all of them is a refusal to think much beyond that so constantly I have family and friends say what what does Johnny think is going to happen and what's what's Johnny's prediction in fact we had a conversation (laughs) along those lines and the answer is Johnny doesn't have any predictions Johnny goes to work to to do his job of of looking after people and looking after their health it's not his job to come up with predictions and you wouldn't want him to think in that kind of big picture way because Already what he does is so overwhelming and intense and important. I think we're all just looking for someone to tell us it's going to be okay. I think it's like (laughs) I ask you every second day, what does Johnny think? Because as long as Johnny is calm, I can remain calm. Like as long as my doctor friends are calm, (laughs) I feel like I can remain calm. But you actually know some people who have corona. Tell me about, because of course we all think we've got it um, and I don't know anyone firsthand who has it. Tell me what their symptoms were and uh, how it played out. Well, in both cases with people I know who had it, I sort of rolled my eyes at first and I was like, yeah, sure, you have it. Everyone thinks they have it. I thought I had it and I actually got tested and I didn't have it. Um, But when I got on the phone with a friend who, who turned out to have it, I gasped because he looked so sick. And he's normally such a healthy person. And I thought that's the difference between me having a kind of scratchy throat for a week and him wearing seven coats in a heated house, still like drenched in sweat with a bright red face. And just I'd never seen him look like that before. What had his symptoms been? Like how did it unfold for him? Just asking Mia. for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let the record show Mia is not wearing seven coats and she does not have a bright red face and she's not drenched in sweat. She looks rather lovely and she's in leopard print. Um, um, it's I, actually I my nightie. <laughs> I'm playing this fun game. Is it corona or am I just having a panic attack? <laughs> <laughs> you look like a healthy person. I mean, this this friend looked so sick and... That was the difference. And did everyone in his house get it? No. In fact, Johnny did share an interesting statistic with me, which is that apparently household transmission is still only at about 50%, which is lower than you'd think. But I guess people really take it seriously. And if they self-isolate within the home, Mm. then it's possible to – I thought it was inevitable that you'd pass it along to everyone in your house, but I guess it's not. Is your friend better? Both friends are better. Well, that's encouraging. How long did it take? About a week for both. And 
One's in his 30s and one's in his 40s, both in good health. But it was encouraging. I really took – it was happy news in both mm. cases. Mm. And they just treated it at home with Panadol. Is that all that they could do? All they could do. One of them is in the UK and one of them is in the US. But either way, they weren't going to burden the hospital system. They just kind of hunkered down with Gatorade, which is a doctor secret I've learned from my husband. You have to hydrate. Yeah. And lots of uh, Tylenol, which I believe is Panadol. And tell me what you're doing to make yourself feel good. Let's oh, yeah. let's share some of the, the positive things that we're doing yeah, to distract and divert. So trying to be really measured about when I, when I read the news and accepting that if I open my New York Times app or my Sydney Morning Herald website, I'm going to feel terrible afterwards. So it's yeah. kind of like, I think I analogize this with you, that it's kind of like I love chips. Like I have a real weakness for chips, like honey soy chicken chips, my favorite thing. <laughs> if I open a bag of honey soy chicken chips and eat them, I'm going to feel really bad. It's just mm. a given. You have to adopt the same mindset with the news, which is I'm plunging in and then I'm going to feel really bad. So that's a reason to limit it. It actually means that I'm not tempted to look more often. So I pretty much only look twice a day. I look in the morning, yeah, feel bad, look in the evening and feel bad. But then you have to chase it with something that makes you feel good. Before we so, move on to the thing that makes you feel good or the things, I want to ask you quickly about Trump. So I read that his approval ratings are through the roof. What is the mood in America and around through him? Through the roof. Through the roof is a little bit of an exaggeration. Yes, they're as high as they've ever been, but his disapproval ratings remain also really high. And I think people right now don't quite understand the seriousness of what's happening. And that's because the only places it's really hit so far are Washington State, New York City, and to some extent, California. Mm. Those places are all extremely liberal, smaller liberal places. But inevitably, it's going to wash over the entire country. Mm. And it doesn't, I don't mean to sound like I'm wishing for that. I'm just stating a fact. It's, it, this is a country where people don't do well with rules and boundaries. And it's going to spread. And when it does spread, he's not going to be able to explain it away. I mean, already 3 million people filed for unemployment last week. That's a lot of people. And, and yet he's whole, saying it's going to, I want everyone back and ready to go by Easter. I mean, all he cares about is the economy. He doesn't care how many people die, right? And he's saying no. this, the, the antidote can't be worse than the problem. So he's basically saying we're just going to have to accept that a whole lot of people are going to die, probably hundreds of thousands, but we've got to save the economy at all costs because he knows that his re-election hopes are based on a strong economy. Is that right? That's right. A couple of points on that. One thing is that people are still really polarised here in terms of how they consume information. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, his approval ratings being quite high, around half the country in a poll that I was reading last week, around half the country still didn't think it was a big deal. Wow. And that's because the country is so siloed in terms of how they consume information. What are they saying on Fox News about it? Well, actually, there's one guy on Fox News. You probably heard of Tucker Carlson, right? Mm. He's like doing PSAs about how people need to socially distance. Mm. And so it's not necessarily like all of Fox News is saying that it's a lie. But I do think that Americans in general have this really inbuilt uh, visceral suspicion of authority and so when authority tells them this is going to get really bad you need to take it seriously they kind of shrug and they maybe go and buy a gun or two Gosh. and I'm not saying it's a stereotype the gun sales are through the roof right now oh. but one thing I will say about Americans which gives me hope is that because their public institutions are so corroded and so lacking in money and resources and so run down individual individuals take on a lot of responsibility themselves. So if Americans think that they need to do something in, as individuals to help their community, they will do it. They have, they have a real sense of community. Mm. And 
So I do have hope that once this becomes something that is not just affecting New York and San Francisco, because those are seen as such bastions of, of liberalism, I think people are going to rally together in a way that Americans traditionally mm-hmm. have. That's very true. And do you think the elections will still happen in November? Apparently, constitutionally, they have to happen. Like, there's no wriggle room on it. It has to happen on that particular day in November. They're already wow. starting to talk about doing, um, a, like, a, a mail, a postal vote for it. This could be optimistic of me, but I just think by November we'll at least know more about it. I just have to think it'll be a little bit under control by then. Mm. And do you think it works for or against Trump's chances of re-election? I think it works against them because, like I say, he can bluster all he want and have his daily press conferences, but the reality is that America is not going to come out of this unscathed. It's mm. kind of a perfect storm of lack of unpaid, uh, lack of paid leave, lack of health insurance, lack of stable employment. It's a perfect storm. It's going to be rough. It is going to be a rough few months and he's not going to be able to sugarcoat it. So to get you through the next few months, tell me what you're reaching for. <laughs> what, what are the moments of sunshine and diversion? So I made a list for you actually because that in itself made me feel good. So TV is really is is really good for taking my mind off things. Basically, once I've read my New York Times, City Morning Herald, other news outlets, I, I'm completely off social media, so it's just me going to reputable news outlets. Then I, I don't want to hear anything else about coronavirus for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. So some TV shows that I've found diverting. Breaking Bad, I just watched the whole uh, show, oh. all six seasons, and I know that it doesn't sound interesting to you, and that's because it didn't sound interesting to me. The premise is this guy, who, a science teacher who makes meth in his backyard, essentially, but it was one of the most diverting, intricately plotted, beautifully made TV shows I've ever seen. Why made you choose that one? Well, Johnny loves it. Mm. And so I kind of was like, oh, we'll just watch this because I'll throw him a bone, the healthcare worker <laughs> on the front lines. But then, <laughs> but then I ended up loving it. So okay. I really recommend that people who thought that sounded boring yeah. watch it. Okay. The Office, the American Office is the most soothing show. It's like Valium in a TV show. Nothing truly bad ever happens and it's 20 minutes long. Everyone's I can do that, yeah, yeah. Curb Your Enthusiasm because it's just so ridiculous and funny. And there's a show on Amazon called Mozart in the Jungle. Oh, I've heard about about that. Yeah, again, the title sounds so boring. I used to think, I don't want to hear about jungles or Mozart. Why would I watch this? (laughs) But it's about classical musicians in New York. It's like if Girls was about 30-somethings and 40-somethings. Yeah, and right. it's sort of a soap in a way, but it's also interspersed with this beautiful classical music, which is also really soothing. And it's again like a half-hour show, so that's really good too for distracting you. And reading books is so important, I think. And mystery novels are what I'm getting into. Not even <laughs> murder mysteries; that's too dark. Mysteries. There's a British writer called Ruth Ware, W A R E. Mm-hmm. And she is so readable and you just get swept away to these these mysteries set on the moors in the north of England and it's just very transporting and I read those um, in bed after I've done my evening news dump. And then finally, music I think is really getting a lot of people through this time. I love all the 90s playlists on Spotify Mm. and I find that if you put music on It seems like a hassle, which is crazy because like everything now is so easy to do. But if you like just get over that and put on music, don't you find that it just makes you feel better about everything? Yes, it's very true. It has a, it can have a really mood altering in a positive way. Like I find that even when I'm working, I'm trying to find sort of calming tunes and you've got to find the thing that matches your mood. You do. You've got to find the right thing. You do. 
And then uh, related to that, my one and a half year old son is enrolled in lots of music classes and they're all taking them online. And he, he's like, how many music classes is my mother going to make me do every day? But I sit there and I sing along and I clap along and I dance and oh. it makes me feel great. That's so good. Kids music yeah, classes, do you think adults can join them or is that creepy? Yeah, kids music classes <laughs> for sure. Oh, can I throw in two other things? Yes. A, hum- a humidifier. Oh. Because it has this really soothing, because um, as anyone who has a baby will know, white noise machines are obviously God's gift to humanity. Humidifiers have a really soothing sound that's a little bit less intense than a white noise machine. But it's it's really calming to put on your humidifier at night and just hear the whirring of the fan. So I'd recommend that. And then also the recipes of Alison Roman, um, who's this New York Times food writer who writes very millennial friendly recipes that generally are preceded by a hashtag. She, <laughs> she's like very big on Instagram. People love hashtag the cookie, hashtag the stew. The stew is the one that Johnny is very good at making. It's with chickpeas and kale and turmeric and all sorts of other it ingredients, but you can freeze it really well. And How do I find that? It's delicious. Alison Roman, A-L-I-S-O-N, Alison Roman. Okay. Just look her up on the New York Times. And the stew is the one that I'd really recommend to people. That sounds very comforting, particularly since we are going into winter, as you yes. all know. Thank you, my beautiful friend. Our conversations in all forms have been helping to get me through. So it's been so nice to just share you with everybody today. And uh, hang in there, send all my love to Johnny and give JJ a big Thank kiss. You. I will. Thanks, Mia. I love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that catch up. Amelia is such a grounding person in my life. Our friendship is one of the most important things to me, even if I have no idea when I'm next going to see her in person. It kind of doesn't matter. We just make do with texts and WhatsApps and FaceTime calls when we can. And on the subject of things being topsy-turvy, we do have a new schedule for No Filter, which you might have noticed during this time. We are going to be dropping three episodes a week on Saturday, Tuesday and Thursday, and we're going to be dropping them early in the morning. If you missed the episode we dropped over the weekend, make sure you scroll back because it was Sarah Marie, the original reality star. And it is just that episode. uh, It's just an explosion of nostalgia and sunshine straight into your ears. She has not changed since I last saw her almost 20 years ago. And the hour that we spent together was just, it was such a delight. I mean, apart from the fact that it was outside my home And everything that's outside my home just feels like this exotic situation from a life that I just don't even remember anymore. She was actually one of the last people outside my immediate family that I hugged before social distancing rules came into play. It was a few days after we recorded our interview. And look, wherever you are right now and however you're feeling, please know that I'm thinking of you and I'm sending my love. And if you're struggling and need some more support, we've made the first week of our online anxiety support course available for free to all No Filter listeners. Just follow the link in the show notes. Until I see you next time or hear you next time, well, until you hear me next time, stay safe and take care.